for much of its history, Apple was on the wrong system of ecosystems, okay? That it was struggling in computing compared to the, the Wintel monopoly, uh, the Windows operating system, Intel microprocessor, and all the three part, third party support. So there's a funny irony of Apple now being the ecosystem champion when they were almost driven into the sea, into to bankruptcy as the kind of inferior actor in the PC ecosystem. that time, we have Napster, we have all sorts of illegal ways of downloading. It kind of works, but then you bring in all these viruses on your computer. Uh, so Apple made legal downloads convenient and cheap. So I can be an ethical person and it doesn't cost me a lot of money. <laughs> uh, and so they, they saw that, that problem the world was facing. Um, and it's interesting in that regard, so that gets going all of just about music with a music playing player, the iPod. Then the next step is the iPhone. So among the smartphones that are coming out, only one had this incredible legacy, and that was Apple, where you could then migrate your commitment, your music library, to this new phone device. Uh, so that's kind of allowed their phone, in addition to their elegance of design, create enormous market presence that wasn't otherwise possible. And then, of course, after that becomes the worlds of apps, um, third-party apps that are sort of gated by Apple. Uh, there's some quality control and there's some, more importantly, there's the financial flows to Apple and their owning of the customer relationship. You as the app provider get money from Apple, but you don't really have direct contact with, with that user. Um, so it's a wonderful, interesting arc and journey from Apple who used to be criticized as the closed vendor. It was just Apple hardware, Apple software, uh, became in the web-based world actually a leader and most art, one of the more artful users of an ecosystem getting third-party uh, provision. Um, so that's, that's the Apple element. Uh, now the other element I think you're also asking, okay, Apple's done it, we see this wonderful this wonderful story, what do I do? Well, obviously in phones, the big competitor is Android slash Google. Uh, and there, what you're seeing is a device independent ecosystem. So the Apple ecosystem, I only access that if I happen to own something called the Apple phone. Uh, whereas Android's gonna license that, you could be Samsung, you could be one of many other um, hardware creators, and for free, at least at the consumer end, will let you use this Android software. And so that's become this sort of powerful alternate um, ecosystem around apps uh, and, and phones um, and, and an equal credible kind, kind, of, kind of player. And then the problem or the challenge from an ecosystem point of view is if I'm an app maker, I wanna go where the users are. So there's a positive reinforcing cycle. Why would I bother spending my scarce engineering time making an app for um, the Microsoft platform when I'm busy already working hard doing the Apple and Android and I have to update those every three or six months anyway? And so there's a little bit of the, the rich get richer kind of cycle. The bigger, more attractive platform attracts the leading and the higher quantity of apps, which then makes that platform more attractive. Um, so I, I, on one hand, I wouldn't want to sort of say, yes, we can engineer it, we can control our destiny. That, that's clearly, I think, too extreme, given the level of ambiguity, the uncertainty about consumer preferences, the way technology goes. But we're not closing our eyes, we're not just throwing dice. Um, and I think what I try to argue for is this middle ground. Let's recognize the inherent uncertainty, but let's create uh, organizational processes and mechanisms that allow us to be very effective in that experimentation, to have some sense of ecosystem and what are the constituent pieces that are gonna be necessary to bring this kind of innovative effort 
forward.